Welcome to this TEDx talk on cybersecurity, how to protect yourself online. I am Arpankar, I teach in IIT Delhi, and uh, I typically work in the interface of dig digital transformation, data sciences, and cybersecurity. So uh, if I talk about my journey, which includes a lot more research, you'll see that most of my research is focused on you know, a lot more data science applications, which is re related to algorithmic approaches, how to make meaning out of unstructured data. And then a lot more is surrounding digital transformation, whether that is you know, at the national level, whether that is at the firm level. But when what we are talking about today is more about how we are talking about the giant leap from digitalization to digital transformation as we are moving more towards a knowledge and you know, innovation economy. So in this context, what we're talking about today is that the ecosystem will have lots of smart people, lots of smart economy, smart mobility, smart environment, smart services, and smart governance. So my focus today's talk is more on the smart services, which are typically called as digital services. And because all the services, all this digital transformation happens on platform, which is driven by data, so data becomes a very core element in which you are introducing a lot more AI ML automation. And of course, that leads to the other problem that there are cybersecurity issues, there are cyber threats when this is initiated. The business model typically depends on, on some elements, it's a face-to-face -face kind of consumer contact. On some elements, it is basically a face-to-screen customer contact. How are these different? So if it is a face-to-face -face consumer con contact, what happens is you as an individual, when you're going to interact with the service provider, you are interacting with the service provider and very rarely you're probably interacting with the technological intervention that is introduced. But in the other model, the face-to-screen consumer contact, what happens is the service provider and the service consumer may not be interacting directly among themselves. They may be interacting only through the technological intervention that is introduced, which might be, you know, directly through a mobile app, through the internet, through the, or some platform. But there is no direct interaction with the service consumer and the service provider. So when we try to talk about the stakeholder issues, fundamentally, there are two kinds of stakeholder. One kind of stakeholder is basically the service provider. And the other kind of stakeholder is basically the service consumer. When we talk about service providers, it could be organizations like, you know, mobile commerce, like Amazon's and the Flipkart's. It could be sharing economy platform providers like Ola, Uber, or Zomato. It could be organizations like the credit card issuers, like uh, when you talk of Amex, American Express, Visa, and MasterCard. It could be the banking service providers like HDFC Bank, ICICI Bank, SBI. Then there is the other segment, the service consumer. The service consumer in a B2B could be another organization or in a B2C or a D2C business model, the service consumer could be an individual like you and me. Now, from the cybersecurity issues perspective, there are three things. One is a technological issue. One is a process issue. The third is basically the people issue. The technological issues are predominantly arising because of certain standards of cybersecurity and encryption that are supposed to be you know, followed from the organization side. It relates to organization process maturity. It also relates to the organization's technological maturity. The process maturity is also about how the organization tries to adopt the technology and you know, kind of incrementally make changes in the processes. These elements of technological issues and the process issues are typically residing within the organization. And therefore, these are outside the locus of control that we as individual consumers have. But what is mainly a challenge is what we talk about as people issues. The people issues can reside within the organizations. The people issues can reside outside the organizations. And when it comes to consumers, it can reside among consumers as well. And this is where the focus is today that we want to understand that people issues can lead to 
cybersecurity problems when we as consumers might not be really that much understanding or knowledgeable about the challenges that cybersecurity typically leads to. So in the people issues, one of the major focus areas is what is called today social engineering. So when we talk of social engineering, multiple approaches of social engineering are typically there. And these are typically you know, trying to ensure that the individuals who are being you know, kind of hacked, their trust is gained. The trust is gained so that they divulge some information to the security, uh, you know, the hackers, so that they can create some security damages. So what are the social engineering approaches? What are there? One of the dominant approaches that you know, typically social engineering operates in is called phishing. It is basically an engineering technique in which the attacker either sends a fraudulent email or might be even calling up the person trying to say that I'm from a reputable source and a trusted source, and this is the action you should be doing. The other one is pretexting or scareware. The pretexting or scareware is an approach in which the attacker, the cybersecurity attacker basically tries to call the person and says that, hey, maybe your credit card is going to expire. Maybe your account is going to lapse and all your you know, information is going to be deleted. So when I'm trying to call that person, that person feels compelled because he's scared. He's scared that his account is going to be, you know, maybe the banking account is going to be deleted. Maybe some other loss is going to happen. And because of that, he's kind of compelled to comply under false pretenses. Then the next approach for social engineering is baiting. Baiting puts somebody something very exciting as an offer. And then because it is an open kind of a approach, because of the bait, which is very exciting as an offer, the unsuspicious person would typically take up the bait and then subsequently tr starts trusting the organization or the individual who is trying to hack. Another approach that typically does not happen for B2C or D2C directly, but happens in organizations quite frequently is called tailgating. Tailgating, what happens? The person who is the hacker would try to gain physical access to the resources, a physical access to a computational device that is much more easier to have that device. But if a person is not able to gain physical access, a lot of times the firewalls in the organization that is typically there it is very difficult to gain those access to those databases. And then another popular one is called quid pro quo. It's a type of social engineering attack in which the attacker would call up the firm, an individual trying to say and call up the, you know, the main line of the firm saying that, hey, I heard that there has been some challenges of the technology, some complaints of the technology at your side. We are from the service provider side. Uh, can you connect me with the person who is facing this problem? So the help desk would typically route you to the person who is actually facing maybe a temporary problem on the technological front. Because the help desk routes that call to the individual employee, the employee is not really you know, suspicious that there is actually a hacking attempt. And then he starts divulging maybe information surrounding the organization and maybe surrounding his own credentials and password. These are some approaches of social engineering that we need to understand. The reason we need to understand that this area of social engineering is because today, most of the cybersecurity threats which are happening are because of social engineering problems. The attackers of cybersecurity, it is very difficult for them to crack into a system easily and then extract value. It's not that it's not happening in organizations, but just that, it is a little bit difficult. Because it is difficult, not much of such initiatives are typically taken such that you know, hackers would hack into the organization's database and extract the data. But more so, individuals are trying this social engineering you know, kind of attacks on other individuals and trying to make you know, benefits out of the entire system. So how can we you know, kind of address how can we try to kind of reduce the negative outcome of social engineering? 
One of the thing is that if you are having a telephonic call that you did not initiate, you did not initiate that telephonic call, but then there is a call that came to you asking for saying that maybe your account is going to be closed down or your credit card is going to be closed down and then ask you to say share some sensitive data. Maybe at the very first level, you might think that this data is not really sensitive. It is just about my date of birth or maybe just the credit card number. But this process, when somebody gives you a call to find out, to shelf out, to fish out sensitive information is one of the very big approaches of social engineering attacks. Then avoid untrusted websites. So what you need to look for are quality proxies for trying to assess whether the website is genuine or not. So for doing that, mechanisms could be to check if the website has got high traffic through proxies like Alexa toolbar, or you can try to see whether that website, that particular domain is actually the domain name very accurately looking at the special characters and try to see whether it is the actual domain name or not. Then the third thing is avoid installing untrusted apps. A lot of times you might get, you know, request SMSs that you should, you know, install this app. And this app is claiming to be maybe an app that you already trust. Maybe a local, you know, uh, maybe a consumer firm maybe a firm which is a platform like Zomato or Uber, which you already trust as a brand. And it says that when you install this app, you get some bonus points. But when you install the app, what happens is, it is not from the Play Store, it is from some other platform. And that platform enables a direct contact between your mobile devices and the platform. And then subsequently, once the app is installed, it gets access, it gets all the required permissions. And then, your phone is hacked and subsequently all your information in the phone can also get hacked. Understand that once your phone is hacked, most of the time your bank accounts are also connected with your phone. So it is very easy to understand bank account details and even monitor the keystrokes of your phone to kind of understand the linkages with your bank account and then monitor the transaction and then even dupe the transactions. The next thing is, Avoid giving information without verification. This is one of the bigger challenges when you talk of, you know, uh, telebanking. You always have a bank relationship manager and the bank relationship managers would tend to change over time. So if you don't know the bank relationship manager and the manager is changing over time, it is very difficult to assess whether the person who is calling you is actually your manager or not. Because he might be calling from another organization or an individual call but you have no mechanism to trace whether the person is actually a bank manager or not. So it is always better to call the bank office number and then try to validate whether this is actually the number of the bank re relationship manager or not. Also, another very, very important thing is if you had not initiated any kind of action, avoid sharing the OTPs. If you did not initiate any action, maybe a transaction, an action could be a transaction, an action could be something like a validation, an action could be creation of an account. But if you did not initiate that action, be ensured that an OTP will not be asked. If somebody calls you up for sharing an OTP, it will always be an action that you have not initiated and is initiated by somebody else. Please be remembering very carefully that if it is initiated by somebody else, it is likely, more likely to be a fishy transaction. It should be always be very careful not to share any OTP for actions you have not really initiated. So what to do? See the challenges, whenever we talk about cybersecurity or challenges of social engineering that result in cybersecurity problems, a typical response is, we should limit, we should not trust any institution, we should limit all our online transactions. But that is not the way forward. That cannot be the way forward given how more and more we are getting digital, more and more digital transformation is taking away our, you know, taking control of all our lives. What we have to do is we have to understand some elements of cybersecurity of what is doable and what is not. 
what is a cybersecurity etiquette? We have to be really sure about that. For example, uh, if there is a mechanism of giving passwords, I know a lot of people, they would write down the password and keep it in a safe space. But that safe space is accessible by a lot more people. Now what happens if it is accessible by a lot more people and you are also sharing it with a lot more people for getting their help and support for consuming the digital services, it is likely to be less of a secret anymore. And this is where it gets a little tricky because you are not really familiar with what is the acceptable ethics when it comes to cybersecurity. Then the next thing is, because of cybersecurity concerns, what happens is we tend to overblow the amount of damage which a cybersecurity can result in. We try to kind of overthink that what is really feasible when it is actually not. We have to be realistic about what is feasible. So cybersecurity is also associated with the potential information risk that a person has. If I have to spend a million dollar to hack into an account and I do not gain sufficient outcome, benefits out of it, then as, as, you know, as a hacker, it does not make economic sense for me to hack that account. And that is where cyber insurance comes into the picture. Understand what is feasible, what is economically beneficial for the hackers to try and emulate. And this is sometimes realistically not really understood and because of which we as consumers tend to have our information, our you know, uh, imagination running really wild. Undertake some basic training in understanding what is information security and risk. That helps you in understanding what should be at a broad level things, very, very elementary things, but you should not be doing it. It helps you to understand what are the very easy things you can kind of control for. And sometimes these days, knowledge is often free. If you visit YouTube, you'll get a lot more in very informative videos, which talks about what is cybersecurity, what are the areas that you need to address if you're going to understand a little bit of cybersecurity risk and more so about social engineering. With this, I'll stop my small talk and hope to have more interactions with everybody soon. Feel free to connect with me in LinkedIn and in Instagram. Thank you.